So my topic is a bit different because whatsoever we are talking is achieving goals. But actually, the topic itself speaks that we fail to achieve TB goals in our patients. So basically, it's introspection and some sort of self-criticism which I am trying to communicate. So there are no conflict of interest and the presentation contains solely my thoughts based on available clinical evidence. And I am so happy that the ignition of this particular topic came from Dr. Anuj Maheshwari, who is luckily sitting here. So thank you very much for challenging me with this topic. And this basically is so true that we have to really introspect what best we can do to achieve CV goals in our patients. So as a preamble, the patients with diabetes have greater burden of atherogenic risk factors as compared to non-diabetics, hypertension, obesity, lipid abnormalities, elevated plasma fibrinogen, and most of these factors, they are present in even pre-diabetic subjects. We are also aware that coronary artery disease in diabetics is different. If we talk of the extent, if we talk of the multivessel involvement, whether we talk of the asymptomatic nature or we talk of silent ischemia and infarction in our patients. We, are, we know that diabetes is a cardiovascular disease which we diagnose and monitor through blood sugar. This is a hard fact. And we also know that hyperglycemia converts and predisposes patients to cardiovascular disease risk. At the same time, we know that controlling hyperglycemia certainly has that benefit in reduction of the cardiovascular disease. So now I'll come to 10 problems which I've identified and let us see how best we can address to it. The first gap is in the patient's perception. The perception in the patient, we know that it's a cardiovascular disease, but if we talk of this study, which is coming from Emirates Diabetes Society, recently published, that 74% of our patients, they don't believe that type 2 diabetes is associated with increased cardiovascular risk. So that perception itself in the minds of the patient is not there. So certainly if the perception is not there, they are not taking that, disease, uh, that diabetes in that perspective. This is slide everyone sees, but I will be only focusing on to what is written in the green, which is not legible here, and we most of the time forget about it. And if we see the changing guidelines, this particular thing has changed, and it is now advising all of us to risk stratify our individuals whenever we are trying to treat diabetes. But once we talk of risk stratification, Dr. Bansi was talking of using Q-risk, or maybe FIF4 score for risk stratifying our individuals. But the fact is, the multivariate risk models, the typical variables which are used here is age, gender, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, systolic blood pressure, diabetes mellitus, and current smoking. But are these the only factors which have to be incorporated? Certainly not. There are many others. If we talk of family history, if we talk of body mass index, Inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, the geographical reason in which the patient lives, the C-reactive protein, the presence of CKD, atrial fibrillation, use of statins, many factors, they basically are to be incorporated in the risk stratification. So for this reason, there is no single risk model which will be appropriate for all patients. So while all risk models have advantages and disadvantages, no risk model is complete. And if we talk of the common risk models which are used, and if I decipher the most commonly used model, that is ACCHA score, then we can see that the family history of premature ASCVD is not included in the model. And the diabetes is just asked as yes or no question. So we know that diabetes incorporates patient age, sex, other cardiovascular risk factors, duration of diabetes, type of diabetes. All these are inherent part of diabetes which are not considered in the, risk model, in the risk stratification model. Furthermore, if we talk of a patient who is having a good risk score, they tend to be falsely reassured for the low risk, which actually is not the same. At the same time, these are 10 years risk 
models. And they do not, do not consider the lifetime risk, which might be substantially higher and amenable to the aggressive risk factor reduction. At the same time, these factors do not account for individual socioeconomic factor. Yesterday, we had ADA uh, uh, lecture on this particular subject. And then these risk models also tend to forget the other ASCVD things like stroke, heart failure, and development of asymptomatic peripheral vascular disease. So what has to be done? So once we are trying to address this disease, then we certainly will have to take into consideration the ASCVD risk enhancers. And then we will have to calculate, then we'll have to personalize, and then we have to reclassify our patient. So certainly, unless and until we do this, we will not be able to address the patient's condition. But then, just ask this question to yourself. In how many of your patients, you really do risk stratification? You really want to do it, but what is the limiting factor? The limiting factor is the time with the clinician. Unless and until you give time to the patient, you will not be able to do all these things. And the second part, once you have done that risk stratification, and then trying to follow the guidelines, you need a lot of gadgets. And the cost of the gadgets, at the same time, to man that gadget with a skilled manpower is another challenge. So in a day-to-day -day practice, once we are trying to follow the guidelines, numerous problems, they come our face. These are the equipments which we are expected to use. And this is something we try to do it in our day-to-day -day practice. Whether we talk of peripheral arterial disease, whether we talk of the uh, neuropathy, whether we talk of the, the shear wave elastography, whether we talk of the early diagnosis of the heart failure, whether we talk of the point of care like HbA1c, CRP, USCR, et cetera. And if suppose we manage to do this also, then what happens? There are problems with the management. We know that we have to give statin to most of our diabetic patients beyond the age of 40 years. That is there in this, uh, the meta-analysis of protein randomized control trial. We know that we have to control hypertension. Yesterday, Dr. Anuj had a lecture on this, that we have to control blood pressure to the best possible. And this is hardly 20, 30% of the patients, they are on goal. What is the fact? And just now, Dr. Vitul mentioned about statin use. And just see the data coming from this trial. 1,55,000 patients studied gaps in the evidence-based therapy. Just see the the lowermost green, only 2.7% of the population were on three evidence-based therapy. And see the top red, 37% of the patients, they are not on any sort of strategy. So where are we? So this is why we don't achieve the cardiovascular goals. So the marked underuse of the evidence-based therapies in type 2 diabetes, a condition that contributes significantly to the overall burden and growth of cardiovascular disease. So problem number five. Once you do this much, what happens next? We know that if we target the disease in a multifactorial manner, we achieve these sort of risk reduction things in micro and macrovascular complications. We also know the legacy story that if we continue handling this multifactorial approach, then we increase the life of the diabetic individual. At the same time, we also have a positive impact in the cardiovascular event-free life to the tune of 8.1 years added to the life of the patient. These are all hard facts which are available to us. But the problem is that multifactorial approach to reduce cardiovascular disease and mortality are underused for both primary and secondary prevention. And then coming to another problem, whenever we are talking of ASCVD, we focus ourselves onto a particular segment. There are missed components, and one of these components is the peripheral vascular disease. We know that peripheral arterial disease is something which is very common, and it has a greater risk of myocardial infarction and stroke, and our sick patients with PAD are six times more likely to die within 10 years than the patient without PAD. And the presence of PAD is there in 20% of the patients as against 7% patients in non-diabetics. So it is certainly there. It is a predisposing factor for the mortality and morbidity, but we forget about it. Then coming to the NASH and CAD, 70% of the patients, they have fatty liver disease on ultrasound. 50%, 55% of the patients, they have that sort of disease that progresses towards the state of hepatitis. And 17%, they ultimately develop cirrhosis. But do we 
really diagnose fibrosis in our patients. And doing these, uh, the shear wave elastography is a limiting factor. Doing a fibro scan is a limiting factor. Going for the, uh, the, the, the chemotactic factors which are labeled, the biomarkers, that is something which is not available at the moment. So the clinical diagnosis of NAFLD should trigger the cardiovascular re-evaluation. That is something which has to be done because we know that it is closely linked to the adverse cardiovascular outcomes. Now, once we have done this much, still, now you start writing the prescription. And then comes the another problem, that you have now focused that for this particular patient, this is the strategy I will follow. But then once you see the patient, there are financial constraints. You may not be able to write GLP-1 RA, you may not be able to write something which is costly or insulin to the patient, which he may not be able to afford. So this is another problem. And once, even if you break that, you may get, or you are at a risk of getting a tag of a costly doctor. This is something which is there once you are trying to follow the guidelines in their full perspective. And then, if suppose you have written the prescription, then the next problem is the compliance and the adherence, which is so very poor. So once the patient is not complying to whatsoever best you have written, once he is not adhering to what you have ad advocated, certainly is not going to get the CV outcomes. And then there are limitations as far as the pregnancy and lactations, uh, lactation scenario is considered. Coming to problem number 10, that is the HbA1c goal. We know that despite all sorts of pharmacotherapeutic advancements and all sorts of advancement in the field of technology, the number of a patient, those who achieve HbA1c goal is not changing for the last 20 years. It is somewhere around 25%. It has not changed. So what has to change to change this figure is something which we have to understand. And if you see the various factors, I will not go into the details of it, but just see the first, insufficient time with the clinician. And this is what, if suppose you change your pattern of practice, start giving more time, the patient will become more compliant, the patient will adhere to it. And if suppose you are maintaining a database, then a patient, those who are not coming in follow-up, call them, and if they start coming to you, mind it, it will improve the controls and it will improve the outcomes in, in our patients. So furthermore, if suppose you are trying to achieve HbA1c goal, then the achieving of HbA1c goal is marred by the fact that it will increase the incidence of hypoglycemia. And we know that hypoglycemia in itself, sitting in the driver's seat, a driver's seat for the adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So the answer to this problem is use strategy which will give you minimum of hypoglycemia. This is something which has to be followed in our day-to-day -day practice. Avoid hypoglycemia in whatsoever way one can do. And then coming to the gaps in identified glycemic variability. Dr. Banshi Sabu will be following after this, and he will be talking about this glycemic variability. In day-to-day -day practice, we forget about it. And it is an independent risk factor for adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So we have to identify it. Maybe if suppose CGM is not possible because we know that it is a gold standard, but it's used in just 1% of our patients. So what we can do? We simply ponder on this SMBG chart, and we can get to know what the glycemic variability the person is having. Then there are miscellaneous issues, like homocysteine. We are aware that it is a risk marker, but do we really get? And it's very simple to treat it. So it's better that we get it done and just put a, a B1, B6 sort of combination to control it. Then coming to the heart failure, and this heart failure is something which we have to identify very early on. And there was a talk, he was speaking on heart failure, and the problem here is failure to diagnose early. This is one problem. And second, poor adherence to GDMT, that is the guideline directed medical therapy. So we have to follow this, that at least four or five pillars for Dr. Paliyapur was speaking, they have to be there on the prescription, so as to effectively counter heart failure in our patients. So my dear friends, what I have learned, I'll just like to communicate. Simply primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary preventions, they are not working at all. What we need to work is on the primordial prevention. And the message which I can give and which I have followed in my life, that address to patients, those who come in your common OPD at the age of 25, 30, 30, uh, 30, 35 years of age, and if they are having a family history of diabetes, if they are having risk factors for diabetes, try to address them 
that you please change here so that you don't develop diabetes. और एक छोटी सी बात जो मैं सबको कहता हूँ जब शादी होती है इनकी कि भाई अपने शादी का सूट बचा के रखो कभी उस सूट के बाहर मत जाओ अपने बी और अपने वेस्ट और अपने बॉडी को उस सूट तक रखो प्रोबेबली यू विल नॉट डेवलप डायबिटीज तो दीज आर द थिंग्स विच विल हैव टू प्रोबेबली एड्रेस टू बिफोर इवन द प्राइमरी प्रिवेंशन कम्स इन टू द पिक्चर तो दीज डेटा प्रोवाइड अ कॉल टू एक्शन फॉर पेशेंट्स प्रोवाइडर्स इंडस्ट्री रेगुलेटर्स professional societies and peers to close these gaps because this cannot be done by only doctors so it has to be a holistic sort of approach so that we address in a primordial manner rather than even the primary or secondary manner and there are various unanswered questions this is going to be the last slide unanswered questions which are there on the slide for the po uh, paucity of time i will not go into it but there are issues which are still unresolved and this is my last slide 33 years in practice and i asked to myself whether i am able to make a positive change or impact in the life of my patient in terms of knowledge motivation psychological aspect disease factor management diet weight exercise or chronology and if i get the answer yes he or she will certainly have good cv goals thank you so much for your patient hearing